Thank you everybody for joining us this evening uh, to our 11th session of artwork, uh, an introduction to CASA with hosts Angeline Simon, Katie Bruce, and Tyler Stewart from Asterix. Uh, my name is Chara Glanders and I am the project, projects manager for the Allied Arts Council uh, here in Lethbridge. I would like to begin tonight by doing a, a land acknowledgement. Uh, the Allied Arts Council acknowledges that we are gathered on the lands of the Blackfoot people and pays respect to the Blackfoot people past, present, and future, while recognizing and respecting their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. Uh, we also are home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, region number three. So just a bit of housekeeping, just wanted to tell you a bit about the Allied Arts Council. We're a 63-year-old uh, multidisciplinary arts service organization. Uh, we run CASA, which is a wonderful facility, and you'll find a bit more about, uh, out about that building and the services that are offered there this evening. Um, we also uh, run a fine arts uh, and craft store on 7th Street. Uh, we put on professional development. Uh, we put on events like Arts Days and Christmas at CASA. We have a wonderful newsletter, which lets artists uh, know about some wonderful opportunities that are available to them. So um, we are a member-based organization. So you can always think about joining the Allied Arts Council. If you're an artist, it's $25 a year. Um, and uh, yeah, it's if you are a, a, a friend or just somebody who's interested in the arts, it's only $15. And you get a lot of great information from us about um, events uh, in our community and also just supporting arts here in Lethbridge. Um, I would like to uh, <laughs> introduce uh, our, our um, presenters tonight, just tell you a little bit about Angeline. Uh, Angeline works at CASA, but more importantly, Angeline is a multidisciplinary artist from Lethbridge. And she graduated from the U of L in 2018 with a BFA in art studio. And she also has uh, experience in exhibition documentation, portrait photography, and product photography. And she is also my partner in crime with artwork. And uh, she did the filming of tonight's presentation. So um, I really appreciate doing her doing that all, all that work. And also I'd like to introduce the Katie Bruce, who is the education manager at CASA. Um, she has received an MFA with a focus in print media from York University in 2015, where her thesis work examined empathy was funded by the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada. She also received a BFA in studio arts from the University of Lethbridge in 2011. Um, Katie practices practice examines empathy, the effective affected body, and the intersection of emotional and non-performative labor. She is also an exceptionally talented arts educator and has instructed up at the University of Lethbridge, and we're very fortunate that she runs the education programming for us at CASA. And then I'd also like to introduce to you Tyler Stewart, Tyler Stewart with Asterix from the University of Lethbridge, and he is going to be um, and, uh, handling the Q&A tonight. If you do have any questions, please put them in chat. We would love to answer uh, any questions that you might have, but I will pass it off to Tyler now. Uh, so take it away, Tyler. Yeah, thanks so much, Tara. Um, so yeah, really excited and grateful to be here for this um, event tonight. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about Asterix, um, Asterix is a, a center for research creation at the University of Lethbridge. So our focus really as a center is to bring together educators, researchers, students, artists, and the community at large, which is why we're really excited to kind of reach out more beyond the university into the community arts, uh, uh, the arts community in Lethbridge here tonight. Um, so we, we encourage research and artistic creation that works across disciplines. We seek to foster training and mentorship and collaborative research opportunities uh, within the arts in Southern Alberta. Um, so our focus really is to support the research and creation of objects, narratives, and experiences that investigate that intersection of arts and technology. Um, <clears throat> a little bit about myself. I'm also, uh, as Tara said, I think I'm 
the uh, graduate, I'm currently a graduate assistant for Asterix uh, uh, Research Center. Um, my, uh, because I am a Master of Arts student at the University of Lethbridge, where my research, my current research focus is on the role of sound within the uh, ongoing structure of settler colonialism. So specifically how sound shapes our su subjective experiences. Um, and my uh, research looks at how the Canadian national anthem is part of that ongoing structure of uh, settler colonialism. Um, so yeah, so tonight's event um, is exciting for us at Asterix to kind of, like I said, build more relationships within the community, not just between Asterix and CAFA, the Allied Arts Council, but hopefully to kind of have some discussion between the folks here tonight to build relationships within the artistic community as well. Um, and really that's the focus of the event, hopefully, um, to also kind of introduce some folks who maybe are more familiar with Asterix to learn more about what happens at CASA, um, especially if you might be uh, students watching tonight to learn about all the amazing facilities that are accessible uh, kind of after you're done with your uh, artistic uh, education at the U of L to to kind of see that the, that CASA really is a, an amazing facility um, that a lot of other cities don't have anything like this. So to be able to have an amazing art studio uh, center like we uh, like CASA is is pretty awesome to have here in Lethbridge. So kind of what we're going to do is. Um, uh, Angeline and Katie have put together kind of an awesome like overview introduction to the building. So it's about a eight or nine minute long video. So we'll kind of go through that so everyone can kind of get a sense of what what is inside of CASA and then we'll have uh, more kind of open discussion questions comments uh both for um about the facilities but what can happen there how you get access to things and all that so uh, maybe i'll turn it over to katie or angeline to kind of say anything else before we jump into the the first video bit here yeah so i'll start the video i just want to let everyone know that it was filmed on a old iphone so please don't have super high expectations <laughs> Multifunctional Arts Center located at 238th Street South in downtown Lethbridge, Alberta. The purpose of this video is to give you a brief overview of the facilities and spaces that are available to artists and community members. At approximately 42,000 square feet of studio and presentation spaces, it is a unique facility in the Lethbridge downtown, providing people of all ages and abilities appropriate, safe, and affordable spaces to create and present their work. Our most popular studio space is the Clay Studio. There are a variety of workstations set out throughout the studio space. This is the hand building area, which is also where the majority of the storage space is located. Studio users are permitted one open area in which to store their clay and tools, but there are also rentable lockers in this space. Each of the canvas tables that are seen here are dedicated to particular clay body types to avoid any kind of cross contamination between your porcelains and your red iron oxides. On the other side of the primary studio space is our wheel throwing area. This space is set up right now for three individuals to use, including anybody that may need a wheelchair accessible wheel, which can be seen in the top right hand corner. CASA also supplies a number of common use tools and materials for studio users. This also includes our slab roller and the clay extruder. There's also ample space to place your wares once they are ready for kiln firings, as well as a damp room for in progress work. This is our glazing studio which is available for community members to use in order to finish their wares. 
Premixed glazes are available on site and include a wide range of colors, as well as facilities for mixing your own glaze chemicals, including a spray booth and a fume hood. All studio spaces require an orientation before access is granted. The woodshop hosts four project spaces for different artists to be working simultaneously and has a miter saw, drill press, planer, table saw, jointer, and bandsaw for all studio users to use. There are also suspended outlets at each of the workspaces for hand tools. The 2D studio is located on the upper floor of CASA and faces north, providing ample natural light throughout the day. As with the clay studio, we have a number of rentable locker spaces, which vary in size depending on the needs of the specific studio user. There is also ample room to store paintings upright, and although not pictured in this video, there are map drawers throughout the studio space for those things that need to remain flat. Each of the workstations in the 2D studio has a flat table, adjustable table, as well as an easel, and two different kinds of chairs. They are spaced accordingly at six feet apart for the remainder of the COVID-19 pandemic. There's also a drying rack and a plate cutter located in the back of the 2D studio. The print studio is CASA's smallest studio space, but hosts a number of different workstations, including a hot plate, a paper soaking sink, ferric chloride etching bath, a standard etching and relief press, as well as a ventilation hood and map drawers. Commonly used chemicals for cleanup are also supplied. The textile and darkroom studio are a joint studio space with this area specifically used for project development, where the high tables are perfect for cutting and the lower tables located near the windows area are perfect for seated sewing with rentable lockers available for you to store your projects. The dye room also converts into a dark room for black and white photography processes, including film development and enlargement available for both medium format and 35 millimeter film. Safe lights and a timer are located on the countertop. Photo development chemicals are also available for studio users who have gone through the orientation process. The textile dyeing space offers a large sink and plenty of drying racks. And additionally offers facilities such as a dyeing painting surface, a vertical electric steamer for heat setting dyed fabrics, common use irons and ironing boards, as well as a dry pigment mixing box for professional and artistic grade chemicals. All the studio spaces covered up until this point are communal by nature and therefore not rentable for individual use. However, there are a number of spaces throughout CASA which are available for rent. The dance studio is located on the upper level of CASA and faces south. There is a piano which is available to studio users as well as a sound system with auxiliary cords. The meeting room is a great option for smaller groups to gather and has the ability to be divided in two with televisions and whiteboards on either side of the space. The community room is a black box theater space 
with staged lighting, sound system, and a large projection screen available, and setup that is specified at the time of rental can be accommodated. The kiosks located on the Rotary Square facing east are also available for rent. They're a great option for those looking for an installation space or looking to host a pop-up shop. The gallery at CASA has two distinct exhibition spaces, each with a movable wall for variable sizes and dimensions. Submissions for these spaces are due every year in November. There are also a number of auxiliary gallery spaces throughout the building, including those on the main floor and upper floor. For additional information about CASA's studio spaces and rentable facilities, please contact us at 403-327-2272. You could have fooled me. Uh, my my iPhone must be much older than the one you shot the video on because it looked pretty good. So, <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks. So, um, I guess uh, as we kind of have a bit of a you know discussion or Q and A about cast in the facilities. Um, again, if you have any questions, throw them in the chat, and I'll kind of moderate that. But maybe I'll start us off with um, asking the question like this. This is a super professional looking facility. Do I have to be a professional artist to use it? I am merely a beginning artist. I'm only getting into woodworking. Is CASA still a place that I can become part of? Yes, definitely. Um, although, of course, you would need at least a little bit of experience in the medium that you're hoping to work in. That's why we offer classes. Katie, did you want to speak a bit to that? Yeah, so as the education manager, I try to program um, introductory courses into each of the uh, studio spaces. We have sort of um, adjacent classroom operations for a lot of those spaces. So we have a, a 2D classroom in addition to a ceramics classroom. Um, and those are normally programmed um, multiple days a week in the evenings. Um, and our programming is cost recovery based. So we try and keep our access um, financially reasonable, but there are also a number of different ways for you to access our, our classes if you do face financial barriers. Um, things like the City Fee Assistance Program um, are, you know, that's one of the ways that you can kind of go through and they cover um, up to 150 or I think it's $200 right now during the pandemic um, worth of classroom or worth of a, a class or course. And that would cover basically any course that you wanted to be enrolled in. So, yeah. Awesome. So, for example, if I wanted to use the woodworking studio, let's say I wanted to start making birdhouses, uh, can I, if I know how to use some of the tools, it would be a situation where I could simply take an orientation to the equipment, or would I have to still like take a class before I could start using the wood shop? Yeah, it's more so required that you're familiar with all the tools in the wood shop. Um, so we would direct you to taking like intro to woodworking. And then if you've already had like fairly similar experience, let's say you went to the university um, in art studio and you've had an orientation in their wood shop and you used all their equipment before, then you'd basically be good to go for our wood shop as well. And we just book you a free orientation um, just to like run through everything and refresh the memory. And I mean, on the orientation forms, there's also sort of like a checklist. So you go over it with whoever's doing your orientation with you so that if there are any questions you're not quite sure about, you can kind of go over some of that if it is just brief. And then at that point in time, they can evaluate whether or not um, you have the adequate experience to just use the space on your own. Right, cool. So even if I haven't gone to university in the art program or something, I could use these spaces as long as I know you know, the equipment, I'm familiar with how to do it safely, most importantly, is really yeah. the reason for the orientation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, cool. 
Okay. Um, so one of the questions Lee is asking here is, uh, is there kind of like a structure for the classes? Like, I mean, obviously, it's, it's, I'm assuming that uh, the classes are, uh, I believe, not happening currently, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, what what is the, those classes look like? I mean, I could maybe answer this question after to provide a participant perspective having done that, but maybe I'll let you speak to that first, uh, Katie. Sure. So classes generally run um, on the same night of the week. So I'm also a printmaker. So when I run my printmaking classes, I generally run them on like a Monday night. Um, they would run for two and a half hours. So most of our studio classes or most of our, yeah, most of our art programming is about between two and three hours long. Um, and between six and eight weeks, depending on the program. Um, the wood shop specifically, the project that you build in that actually takes you through absolutely every one of those wonderful tools that we highlighted so that you're getting the adequate experience and then you can just go in there and, and work as you need to. Um, we offer programming three times a year. So there's a fall session which starts in September, a winter session that starts in January, and then a spring summer which starts in May. Um, and generally speaking, for a lot of those classes, I try and program at least um, two of them in per session. So I'll have like an intro to drawing class that starts in September and then one that starts in November as well. Cool. Yeah. And to kind of speak from my own experience doing basically what Katie just described. So I took a, a very good printmaking class with Katie, I guess, maybe two winters ago now. Um, and we walked through a variety of different types of printmaking. Like, yes, I have an art background, but I did never, I never touched a printing press or did any printmaking really that I can remember. Maybe I blocked it out of my memory so long ago. Um, but uh, it was great to see a few different kinds of things and try them out and have all, you know, the chemicals there, the materials, the, the things you would need to do to try everything out. Um, what I also really liked about the course is that it kind of like introduced me to other people. Like it wasn't just me doing the course by myself with Katie. There was about 10 or 12 of us in the class. So you got to meet other people, some of whom you know, were uh, BFA students from the university, some were folks my age, some were, you know, middle aged folks who were kind of coming back to printmaking after having done it a long time ago. So maybe you could also like speak to like, what kind of people hang out and use all these spaces at CASA? Like, is it mostly former like university students or is it kind of a, a broad range of everybody? Yeah, I'd say it's a broad range. Um, there's definitely some university students. There's definitely, yeah, people of all ages. To be in the studios, you do need to be over 18. Um, just say that as a reminder, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, cool. generally speaking, we have a, a bit of an older demographic just in general, um, which is why this is kind of a wonderful program for us to collaborate with Tyler on because we are trying to bring in a couple sort of the, the out of university folks. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. and here's, here, sorry, go ahead there. No, no, go for it. Okay, well, I was gonna say like, I mean, so I would describe both of you as professional practicing artists. So yes, CASA is for everyone. You don't need to be a professional artist, but maybe both of you could just briefly speak to like having been at the University of Lethbridge. And then once you graduate, you can't use all of the stuff there for free. I mean, you're paying tuition to use it. It's not really free, but like you don't get access to all those studio spaces. So maybe you can just speak to like the value of CASA as a place to continue your professional practice. Um, I can speak as a graduate that this the CASA didn't actually open before I left to go and do my master's. And that was a large part of why I left the city was because I didn't have um, a facility space that was going to be able to accommodate the kinds of like giant and weird projects that I wanted to take on. Um, so it was a driving factor for me to leave Lethbridge. And then in 2016, I came back to do an artist residency at CASA. And at that point it was like, what am I doing in Toronto where I'm struggling to get like adequate studio access to a space at an affordable rate when I could have studio access for $200 a year at CASA. Um, and that was like a huge factor in me returning to Lethbridge. 
just to interject, to clarify, it's for $200 a year, you could access all of the things we saw in that video, like all of those spaces. There's not like a fee per space. As long as you've got orientations in each of the spaces, you're good to go. Yeah. I mean, that's always been the part that's blown me away most about studio access for CASA is that it's like something like $15 a month or maybe not quite $20 a month to use all of those spaces. So, and maybe, uh, sorry, I don't want to, I'll, maybe I'll go back to Angeline and you can, you can in, uh, kind of speak to that point as well. And then we'll answer a couple questions from the, from uh, the chat. Um, yeah, so the rent, sorry, the membership, so $30 a month plus GST, um, that doesn't include a locker. So I believe all the studios have lockers. Um, the wood shop has like massive ones, but unfortunately they're frequently booked up. Um, so there's a bit of a waiting list on that, but all the other lockers, like they're, they're smaller, they're like a square, um, they're $5 plus GST a month. It's pretty cheap. Um, and then, yeah, the yearly membership is 200 plus GST, and we used to do um, daily drop-in. We haven't done that during COVID. Um, we're hoping to bring that back after the pandemic, and it'll probably be, we say, $10, $10 drop-in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that could even be a situation where if you were like, oh, I want to do this one specific thing, but I don't have a table saw, I could, you know, pay for a daily drop-in to come in and cut some lumber for a specific project and not have to pay for a monthly thing if I only really going to use it for a day or two, but. Exactly. Yeah. And um, with the monthly and yearly membership, uh, we used to offer like an overnight, like you could come in basically any time of the evening if you really wished. So some people would work until like midnight in the spaces. We do recommend like a buddy system, like we have someone also there with you. Um, we haven't been doing that during the pandemic, but we'll probably return to that um, afterwards. So you'll get a little fob. I forgot to say that. You get a little fob, right, right. You get, like just fob the door and then you get in. Uh, and there's like a signing sheet at the front desk, just so we can like keep track of everyone who's um, using the space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so just to go back to a question that uh, was in the chat. Um, in terms of like the courses and stuff, is that, um, you know, does that need like a lot of extra materials or stuff? I remember from my course, I believe basically all the materials were included for the printmaking course. Yeah, for most of our courses, all the materials are included. Um, with the exception of like the drawing course, we generally get people to pick up their own pencils and, and paper for that. Um, but those are within the core classes. We also have another streaming stream of programming um, which is our artist partnerships. And those are programs that are proposed by folks in the community that are particularly passionate about uh, stained glass, for instance. Um, those ones, there are material costs that are associated with them, but they come with like a, when you sign up, you get a material list um, and you can kind of preview that ahead of time to determine whether or not it's going to be cost prohibitive or not. But for the most part, a lot of those classes um, do have their supplies included. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and is that membership cost the same for like basically everyone, regardless of if you're a student or an adult or a senior? Is the, the fees kind of vary depending on those factors at all? Um, we do have a student rate. So our student um, memberships go for fifty. Sorry. Oh, yeah, it's just talking about the duration. <laughs> so it'd be like September, October, November. Um, and December. So that would be like their fall duration and that would be $50 plus GST. Um, and then like the winter, the January, February, March, April, and then the summer, spring, summer one. Um, yeah, but we don't have a senior rate, unfortunately, but that is something to consider. We could definitely bring that up one day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, still, a, yeah, like great, great, uh, great value there. Again, thinking of um, I've, I've never rented an art studio space myself personally, um, but having been a musician for a very long time and also having lived in Toronto for a period of time, things like renting a jam space or access to a place to make art can often be like almost enough to make you quit making art because you can't afford to rent a garage to paint in or to have a shop on the outside of town to to you know make whatever various kinds of art you, you might make you need some
space sometimes to kind of have that. So access to CASA at that rate is like a very, yeah, good, good value for money. Um, yeah, so there's another question here that's a really great one. Uh, are there any currently any facilities or programs at CASA that accommodate artists working more specifically in digital media like video, photo, or audio? Unfortunately, no. The studio spaces that you saw were the ones that are available there. If it was a matter of you needing a space to record in, you could probably rent out the, the meeting room for that kind of purpose because it is a space that you can make smaller and therefore less echoey. Um, but in terms of um, facilities specifically for that, unfortunately, we don't. Yeah, the one thing I would say that CASA does have that I'm familiar with that maybe um, either of you could speak to is um, not a program or a sort of a program, I guess, like the exhibition um, spaces, which there are multiple in the building. And one of the exhibition spaces being like a dedicated kind of like digital platform for presenting digital artworks. Um, I'm going to throw that to Angeline because she works fairly hand in hand with Darcy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, yeah. So there's a lot of like auxiliary spaces around the building. Um, we used to have like the big screen outside the building, but it's not working anymore. We used to be able to have like video um, art up there, but um, I don't know the status on it. I think we were trying to get it repaired, but uh, we've hit a bit of a roadblock with that. Um, but yeah, we've definitely had uh, video projects presented on the main, um, the main building, like outside the main gallery, there's like a TV. Um, Darcy's definitely done a lot of video um, art there. Yeah, I mean, that's what I've, that's what I was thinking of specifically that space that, you know, sometimes you walk into an art gallery and it's all painting or it's all sculpture or something else, but no matter what at CASA, in addition to the gallery space and the other kind of auxiliary spaces, there's like kind of always a uh, video presentation um, platform, which I think is really cool because that's often a very difficult thing to uh, exhibit video artwork uh, because, you know, you have to transform a space and set up projectors, whereas that's like a dedicated space, which I think is really great, so. Mm -hmm. um, um, oh, go for it. Oh, go ahead, yeah. I was just gonna say, I think we missed one question about um, oh. explaining studio access. So right now our current protocols, um, when the studio is open again, um, is that individuals are able to call in and book a spot in each of the studio spaces. So we have limited capacity right now um, 10%, 15% of, uh, fire capacity, essentially. Um, and you're booked into sort of a, a morning or, or afternoon time slot. So you're given ample time. Like, I think they're between four and five hour, um, appointment slots, um, for folks to kind of like dig in and be able to work on their project. And then depending on the availability, they might be able to stay longer, um, whether if, if there's room in, in the um, other kind of appointment slot so yeah great thanks um and kind of furthermore to that point of access um the question here about um while a class is on let's say katie was giving a print making class and i wanted to come in and print something um would is our, essentially those spaces become kind of off limits while the class is on Correct. Yeah. So there are um, the printmaking classes and the uh, woodworking classes are the only ones that use the studio spaces that you saw there. So we also have a 2D classroom and a ceramics classroom, um, which are generally where we keep our painting and drawing and then our, our clay wheel and hand building courses. So there are some limits in terms of accessing simultaneously, like the class is going to take priority over that. Um, but because they only run, those ones only run generally once a week. Um, so there are other evening times for you to be able to access. Mm -hmm. Well, sorry, go ahead, Angeline, you're going to say something. I was just going to say we have a little calendar outside of each studio. Um, so if it is that there is a class, it'll be listed on there. So you'll see it and you'll know that you can't access the studio at that time. 
Yeah, well, I, there was another question I was going to ask, just generally speaking, I guess, like COVID aside, uh, like how busy are each of these spaces? You know, if I wanted to come in and build something in the woodworking shop or in the printmaking studio, are they on a normal basis kind of like so busy that it's like hard to get access? You kind of have to be patient and wait or what like, yeah, maybe you can just speak to kind of like the access to the equipment based on demand of uh, participants or artists or users of the space. Yeah, before we shut down uh, in mid-December, some of the studios were quite busy. Um, the ceramic studio and the wood shop, there would be a couple times where I had to turn people away and say like, sorry, like you'd have to book a different time. Um, before the pandemic, though, I don't think we had too, too many issues, um, but those two studios are, I'd say, the busiest. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's good feedback. Um, so a, a couple other questions here that are more specific about um, spaces. This is one that I had, too, um, kind of about the ceramic studio. So how does that work get fired or the glazing and those types of things, which I don't know what I'm talking about because I'm not... <laughs> that familiar with that medium but wh where there are specific mediums where you need like an additional kind of thing um is is that support there with cast of staff or how would you have something fired in the ceramic studio yeah we we have a technician his name is aaron um he's awesome he fires quite often um i'd say before the pandemic he would like every week the kilns are running, um, people would be like just leaving their stuff on a shelf. He would tell you where to leave your items. Um, we do a bisque, so a, a bisque fire, and then we do a cone six fire. Once in a while we do cone 10, it's not very often though, and that'd be only like a couple times a year. Uh, we do have some like house-made glazes. These are giant buckets where you just have to mix them up and then you can dip your items in um, and there's just like some basic colors. But besides that, we also do order glazes and clay um, from Plainsman in Medicine Hat. So if you are a studio user, you can definitely get in on an order. Aaron puts out a call to everyone. Um, he'll let everyone know that he's placing an order and then you can go onto their website and um, pick something out that you'd like him to order. We also have um, a gas kiln, which probably gets fired about the same amount as the cone tin. Um, and we do occasionally um, schedule in raku firings as well, which is something that you have to do outside because there's an awful lot of smoke and fire involved. Yeah, that's cool. So there, essentially what you're saying is there's a certain amount of like basic regular kind of um, procedures that happen. But again, more specialized things can become available based on demand or um, certain times of year for maybe an extra cost or those types of things. Yeah, I mean, if you've got enough work to um, fill a kiln on your own because you've managed to pump out 80 pieces or whatever the case may be, um, he can organize kind of to have a special firing for you if it's something that's outside of the normal schedule. So great. Yeah. And Aaron also just charges by how much you put into the kiln. So it's just basically by item, like a cup, I think, costs like a dollar or so. Yeah. Great, cool. Um, so there's another question here uh, specifically about the presses, which I'm sure Katie could give us an exhaustive amount of detail about what the presses are. Um, so we have a Rembrandt Graphic uh, Arts Co. Inc. Uh, press. It's got a press bed that's 28 inches by 48 inches, um, and it can print relief or etching um, regardless of it, you know, it raises and lowers as needed. Um, you can set the height of the press uh, roller, depending on what you're needing. We also have like a small um, relief press, which is like a sandwich. So I, I can't do this actually with two hands, so I don't know why I'm trying to do this, but essentially you just like clamp it down and it, uh, it takes an impression for you. There is another smaller press, but we tend to use that only in the children's classes. So, yeah. Cool. Um, the other question I was going to ask in terms of the spaces um, is, is, are all these spaces uh, like mobility accessible? Are there, um, you know, any physical constraints or limitations to accessing any of the equipment we've kind of been talking about so far? 
Um, in the clay studio um, and in the clay classroom, we have wheelchair accessible wheels. So those are great for folks because the the way that you throw a pot, I'm going to try and do this, you have to like brace your elbows on your legs in order to kind of keep that center um, centered. And so this one actually like raises and lowers and you can control it either with a, a lever or with your foot, depending on what your access needs are. Um, and then the other studio spaces are all on a fob system. So it'd be a matter of sort of like keying in as Angeline was kind of speaking about. Um, those doors unfortunately don't have accessible buttons in order to make the door open on its own. But it is something that if you came to the front desk and we knew where you were headed in the building, we could easily um, open up that space for you. Great, yeah, that's good to know too. Um, so, I mean, maybe to um, just uh, kind of go back to the question of, um, you know, moving from, you know, all, all three of us here at least have used the studio facilities at the University of Lethbridge. Um, so just in terms of like the equipment available and resources, maybe you can speak to like, how does it compare to the U of L studio? If you're, if you've been a student in the past and are you familiar with those? Um, is it like vastly different or like way better or nicer, cleaner, newer, or what is it? Like how, how is it different or how is it similar? Um, in terms of the, so obviously there's no individual studio spaces. So that's a big difference between sort of your advanced and senior studio experience versus stepping into CASA. Um, you don't have a spot where you can just, you know, pile up and leave all your things as you feel inclined, they do need to be tucked away at the end of the day because it is a communal working area. Um, I can speak to the printmaking facilities. Angeline might be able to speak to some of the other ones. Um, obviously, it's a significantly smaller print studio, but with that, there is significantly less demand on the space. So quite frequently, you have that whole area just to yourself. And I, for one, you like to take up every single work surface that I possibly can when I'm in there and it feels great. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit more breathing room. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, I will say that the dark room at the university is quite nice um, and ours doesn't really compare, unfortunately. The thing <laughs> is also, we just don't have a lot of demand. Um, throughout the year, I'll have maybe like three or four people tops use the dark room. So that dark room is shared with the text, like with the dye room. So you'd have to um, book it out and you'd have to put a little sticky on the door and say like dark room in use and then put up a little curtain if you really wanna block off all the light. Uh, yeah, the university has like an amazing dark room. It is so big, there's so many stations. There's probably like 13 enlargers. Um, so it is different. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But then on the other hand, we've got the ceramics space at. CASA is significantly more developed than sort of the corner areas that are shoved around in the um, ULF spaces. So pluses and minuses across the board. For sure. Um, a question I just saw here uh, specifically to what we're kind of talking about right now is in regards to the, uh, I guess the chemicals available for the dark room are just for black and white. Yeah, right now it's just black and white. We had a bit of a conversation about wanting to get um, color development in there too. We just don't have really good ventilation in that room. Um, and I was told that the chemicals for color development are a little bit more toxic. And so for that reason, we've just trying to keep it simple and just do black and white. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, to go back to another question from a little a uh, few moments ago, just back to the classes. So are all classes kind of like age uh, bracketed or is it possible, for example, a parent to take a class with their child? So we do have um, kind of, I guess, three major blocks. We've got our kids, adults and a generations course. So kids, we offer um, ages six to nine and then nine to 12. We do have some youth courses that are available through that stream, which is 12 to 15 years old. Adults is basically anybody 16 and older, unless it's a woodworking course, in which case you have to be 18. But we do offer generations and generations experiences are geared towards families making together. 
So depending on the age of um, the individual in question, they could sign up for like a generations clay hand building, which is perfect for six and up, plus any kind of caregiver that wants to attend with them. Um, clay wheel starts at ages nine because you do need to have some mode of upper body strength in order to center and be successful at it. Um, but we do have a generations course in that. And then occasionally we have um, other courses that also run in that generation stream, which is yeah, geared towards family creation. Cool, that's awesome, yeah, thanks. Um, <clears throat> um, just uh, make sure I don't skip any of these questions. Um, there's another good one here in regards to um, the exhibition spaces at CASA. Like how, how would I go about applying for an exhibition? What kind of requirements uh, uh, are there in that and how do you like where where and how do I apply to exhibit my work at CASA? Um, at the front desk of CASA we have like a little handout that we can give people uh, when they have questions like this and it should list everything that's required off the top of my head. Um, it'd be basically like your CV and image list like your proposal of what you want to do and present. Um, yeah so it uh, we take applications every year in November, and then Darcy will review them and get back to um, the artists. Mm -hmm. And so is that for the, just for the art gallery space, or is that for all of the kind of smaller exhibition spaces around the uh, building? Um, Katie, did you ask Darcy if he takes, okay, never mind. <laughs> That's something um, I, we're fairly certain that the auxiliary spaces are taken on a kind of um, more on, relaxed. ongoing kind of basis. Thank yeah. you. Those are the words yeah, that I was is. trying to find. Yeah, on an ongoing basis. And then they're reviewed and programmed as possible. Um, OK. Yeah. Cool. Um, th this is also maybe a good uh, point in time to kind of bring up or introduce um, AAC works which is less of an exhibition space and more of a kind of commercial storefront for artists. So maybe one of you could tell me what is AAC Works? What is Tyler talking about? That's not at CASA. Katie, okay, you wanna take that one? <laughs> sure, um, so AAC Works is a storefront located at our 7th Street office. Um, it is basically geared towards um, Lethbridge makers. So I think it's three times a year, there is sort of a call for uh, new artists to submit work. And it's very similar in terms of like uh, a bio, um, an image list and your images uh, and an application form kind of talking about um, what your experiences are and, and how you self-identify in terms of a maker. Um, and then those are juried and selected artists um, then are, are programmed into this space and they become part of the storefront. Um, the next upcoming intake will be in June. So you can probably go to um, either the AAC website or the AAC Works website um, to get that um, application information. Cool. Yeah. And there's some amazing stuff in there. Like it's nice to have a space in Lethbridge that, you know, there's lots of great, um, you know, stores that sell cool things, but to have a place that's kind of uniquely dedicated to practicing artists, um, you know, especially in the local area. Um, yeah. It's just like a really nice um, aspect of supporting the work of practicing artists. And it's a huge range too. Like it's not just ceramics and oil paintings. Um, we've got lots of textile work going on in there right now. There are candles and soap and yeah, it's like a really wide range of different kinds of, um, of craft products. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so we're kind of coming up close to an hour now. Um, I'm not sure if other people have other, like if you have another question that uh, hasn't been asked yet, please kind of throw it in the chat. Um, I think I've kind of gone through most of mine. I guess the one other question I had too was just in regards to like storing artwork. We kind of talked a little bit about that. Um, <clears throat> and maybe you can kind of speak to like what the storage um, capacity is for like 
smaller projects versus let's say I'm an artist working on a bigger project for that's going to be exhibited at, <clears throat> at a gallery somewhere. Is that something that there's capacity to kind of store larger artworks or how does, how does maybe you can just, yeah, kind of more generally speak to that aspect of storing your work there, or is it a thing you might have to bring in and out depending on what it is? I think it's safe to say that works in progress can generally be accommodated, um, but it is something where we have to be respectful of the fact that it is a communal space. So there isn't unlimited um, storage spaces for everybody. Like the in the 2D studio, you saw the sort of painting slots that were there. We try and keep, um, you know, to a reasonable number between one and two. They are about five feet deep, so you can definitely get a lot of paintings in there, um, depending on the size that you're working on. But we do ask that once you're finished with your project that you take it home. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, and the other question I had in regards to kind of ongoing projects and uh, things like that, um, like, Okay, so I'm going to uh, take a printmaking course and then start doing some printmaking. Can I purchase art supplies through CASA? Where the heck does one purchase art supplies in Lethbridge? <laughs> oh, that's a little tricky. <laughs> um, when I was going to the university, I got most of my supplies there, um, but I don't think that's accessible to the public right now. And we have Michael's, not the best. Uh, a lot of great supplies are in Calgary and Katie, like, I think you order a lot of your supplies as well. online. I, I generally do. I order most of my supplies either from um, Calgary locations or from Ontario, because that's where I kind of, I know where all the things are hiding. Um, but for example, like in Calgary, there's Mona Lisa art supplies. Um, there's Inglewood art supplies and there's there's a Kensington one as well. And they're all very good, very knowledgeable individuals and they're able to assist you. Um, mm -hmm. Do yeah. they ship? I, yeah, they do ship things out. Um, so that's one of the nice things as well as, of course, we've got, if you're working in ceramics, um, you can order your clay through us. We do have some, we do have a lot of clay on hand. Um, glazes would have to be special ordered in, but the way that Aaron does that is that he kind of gives you a deal on shipping regardless. So if it's something that kind of can be tied into our three or four sort of orders a year, um, you can definitely save yourself a couple of bucks that way. Cool. Yeah. Uh, play tools as well. Yes. Okay. That, that's good to know. I know the university bookstore um, does have some limited art supplies and they are still, again, like open on a limited basis or maybe only for, you know, curb, it's not quite curbside pickup. I don't think you can just go in and browse kind of currently, but um, they do have some limited stuff, but maybe that's, uh, maybe that's the thing the Allied Arts Council can, you know, expand into art supplies given sadly that uh, the studio, which was quite a, quite a good little store for, for Lethbridge has mm -hmm. closed in the past couple of years, so. Cool. Well, I don't see any other um, uh, kind of questions in the chat. I hope this has been like helpful for those who are uh, watching, like just to get a sense of what the space is like, what you can do there. Um, you know, some of the possibilities and opportunities of, of working in CASA. Um, so yeah, this was really great. I don't, I don't have anything else to offer. Um, Angeline, Katie or Tara. Um, anything else I, that i, I haven't just, thought of I would, I would just say thank you so much tyler for stick handling all the q a you did an amazing job are you are you having anything with asterisk coming up through the summer um yes yeah. what's your next so, event yeah yeah we're um i mean we're kind of going into a uh, summer period with the university which things get quiet um we are in the process though of planning a bunch of events for um next fall um, so our intersections series has uh, focused on things like grant writing for artists or uh, kind of uh, panel discussion on collaboration was one of our last events. Um, we're also hosting uh, some more uh, artist talks next year, which will feature likely both faculty and uh, graduate and undergraduate students. Nice. Um, so we'll uh, get in touch with people um, following the um, uh, 
uh, the event just to kind of give uh, more information about Asterix as well and how you can kind of keep in touch uh, with our events as well. Great. Um, somebody was just asking, uh, is there a digital membership application form? Unfortunately, there is not. It is available online, though, at our website, www.artslethbridge.org. Um, under the membership section, there is an artist membership form, and you can just print that off. You can either drop it off to our office at 318 7th Street, or just uh, send it to us via email. Uh, and our next, just to let you know, our next artwork will be June 3rd. Uh, we have some great artists from Edmonton who are going to be sharing with us how to paint a mural. Uh, the public art uh, uh, project right now for the city of Lethbridge, which the LA Arts Council sits on and has helped jury. Uh, we are going to be starting to see more murals in the downtown uh, areas on walls downtown. And so that's an exciting project that the city is supporting. And so uh, these two artists uh, are just going to tell you how to do it because obviously um, it's a big space and, and what sort of, uh, what do you use and how do you do it? So that will be June 3rd at six o'clock. So I just want to thank everybody very much for joining us. Uh, Tyler, thank you so much. Uh, it was great to collaborate with you on this uh, in this event. And thank you, Katie and Angeline, um, for uh, telling us all about CASA. We are extremely fortunate in the city to have access to uh, this amazing facility. And so thank you, everybody, for joining us. And uh, everybody, stay safe and have a great evening. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Bye, Tyler.